Xbox On. Welcome to Xbox On, the podcast with one host about one console, the Xbox One. I am said host, Jesse DeRosa, and on today's episode, we'll be talking about the latest Xbox news for the week of April 2nd, 2020, including analysts suspect the Xbox Series X could be delayed due to COVID-19. A handful of Xbox Game Studios titles have had their release dates pushed back. Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2 is getting a remaster and more. So earlier this morning, my girlfriend and I were having the discussion. I don't know how we got on this topic, but we were talking about wisdom teeth and you know how they say, well, the reason why people don't really need their wisdom teeth is it's kind of like a human evolution thing where when we used to eat more like, I don't know, like rough, raw meats, dead animals, whatever the fuck it was when we were cavemen, you know, you used to need those back teeth to really dig into tough food. And now as we've kind of grown up and advanced and you know, gotten away from some or some different older eating habits. We kind of have lost the need for those wisdom teeth or, or whatever it was. And so that's why people have them removed. That's why they've kind of become an obsolete part of the human body. We're just kind of talking about that, that moment in evolution. And it got me thinking, you know, what if one day, you know, hundreds of years from now, future generations of people grow up with like contoured palms in their hands that are just right for like an xbox gamepad or a dual shock 4 or something or like um just like super muscular thumbs just from decades and, and generations and, and years and years of gaming and gaming and uh, it makes me wonder if maybe humans will evolve to adapt more to the necessary peripherals and accessories required for gaming and probably probably absolutely will happen but yeah it's just interesting food for thought aside from that let's jump into our quick common shout outs from last week's episode our first one comes from my brother who says in regards to my comments on ben and jerry's ice cream he says ben and jerry's has a dairy-free ice cream that is amazing the other brands don't even have an option out there so i appreciate that shout out to them well i don't i think ben and jerry's wins by more than just default so i don't really appreciate you giving them a shout out just for their dairy-free ice cream but nonetheless of course shout out to ben and ben and jerry's the one and only lethal mind grain comes in with a can't follow you on twitter the secret service said no you're damn right that's why i don't give you my my handle because i have the cure to the goddamn coronavirus and i'm and it's withheld in my Twitter DMs, which you'll never have access to. Dead Captain James coming in on in regards to Bleeding Edge's launch last week. He says, Bleeding Edge is so much fun. I've played it since Alpha. I love it because it's not Overwatch. While I kind of disagree in the sense that I don't personally care for Bleeding Edge, of course, it's subjective. I'm glad you're enjoying it, and you're welcome to your own opinion. I will agree with you uh, on the fact that, hey, it's not Overwatch, and that's, that's a great thing because... The last thing this world needs is more Overwatch. Let's see, my brother comes back in by saying, You made a pretty good point about the variety of Xbox. PlayStation's lineup of first-party titles are all heavily narrative-based games with huge worlds. Xbox has a ton of games. I think people should recognize this more. Xbox deserves a lot more credit than it gets. Yeah, and I think, I mean, there's not really much to say on this. This is kind of what I was ranting about and I've ranted about in the past. But yeah, Xbox definitely deserves some more respect for its, its kind of diversity of game genres and in game types rather than just you know catering to the triple a it's like it's like sure sony's making like these uh best picture kind of triple a games all the time but they're never making anything other than that and that's just kind of a a little tiring when it's like well you know there's more than just that one thing whereas xbox you know isn't always making that best picture kind of triple a game but sometimes they're making you know the summer blockbuster or the indie project or just you know some different things so I, uh, I appreciate that about Xbox. Let's see. Getting back into it, our next comment comes from Lethal Migraine again, who says, Xbox needs way more single-player big stories. It's way too, It has way too many multiplayer games and short campaigns. That's why people say Xbox has no games. Big stories are what the majority crave. The initiative better be on par with Naughty Dog, a big world, single-player, epic campaign, whatever. Um, so yeah, this is, to go off what we were just literally talking about, I think this is a fair point as well, that while, yes, Microsoft does have a good variety of games and does deserve some more recognition for that, they do need these kinds of games. It's not to say that they don't need them or that there isn't a desire or a market for them because obviously clearly what Sh- what Sony has shown is there absolutely is a market for these games and 
I would also prefer if Microsoft had a few more of these, which is ex- exactly why they built the initiative. I think that's the entire purpose of the initiative. It's a studio that pulls from all the best talent, like from studios like Naughty Dog, and they're being given like an unlimited budget to make what Phil Spencer refers to as a quadruple A studio. So again, yeah, that intention is definitely to make a massive, big triple quadruple a uh, what i assume to be a narrative driven game so i'm pretty sure that's what we're getting from the initiative but yeah a, a fair point all right and that's going to do it for our comments shout outs from this week remember as always for future episodes don't be shy reply i think we're uh the show's actually getting starting to get a little less traction it's weird i tweeted out this week the show's actually hit roughly 300 concurrent listeners i'm finally getting enough hits on spotify to start getting those analytics i now get analytics from every platform the podcast is on except for apple Podcasts, because i guess you have to have a shit ton of of subscribers and reviews in order for apple to think you're worth giving analytics to so i don't know if there's two people on apple or 200 people on apple or zero people on apple listening to me but i just don't have those numbers really um i I think it means there's probably like 10 or something but between youtube soundcloud spotify Castbox, all these other uh google podcasts all these other services i'm i'm hitting 300 plus per episode now so big thank you to everyone who listened listens or has whatever in any capacity has ever heard the show before deeply appreciate your time uh listening to me rant especially when there are probably better xbox podcasts out there let's be honest and speaking of better xbox podcasts earlier this week uh, phil spencer was on ign's podcast unlocked their weekly xbox podcast so we will kind of delve into that a little bit just because that interview extracted some information from Spencer, which I think is going to help with today's news. So definitely go ahead and I'm, I'm going to actually su- recommend that you go listen to that Xbox podcast this week because that was a really great interview with Phil Spencer and it's definitely worth your time if you want to hear all about the Xbox Series X from the uh, the big boss himself. Um, so without further ado, we are going to get into what I've been playing before we get into the news. But of course, before I can tell you what I've been playing, I have to tell you all about what I've been eating. And so this week, instead of telling you what I've been eating because I've been on house arrest, I mean, COVID, uh, I haven't really been anywhere since everything's closed. I've uh, I got a little something for you. I got so Mountain Dew Frostbite. It's a new Mountain Dew flavor. It uh, it's exclusive to Walmart. So if you have, if you are familiar with the uh, with the with the retail chain Walmart, you can stop by and pick up some Mountain Dew Frostbite. It's a new flavor of Mountain Dew. It has some awesome can artwork with this awesome shark kind of chomping through a frozen wasteland. It's pretty badass can art. But I got I got to be honest, as a massive Mountain Dew fan. A little, a little disappointed by the flavor profile. It's it's just okay. It tastes kind of like a Diet Liberty Brew, which was their exclusive flavor from last year. It's like super toned down and mild, which I don't hate, but um, I, I don't know. The flavor just is kind of uninspired and nothing really uh, distinctive about it. But nonetheless, it's always fun to have a new Mountain Dew flavor, especially if you're weird like me and you and you obsess over these things. So if you're if you're even remotely interested in the world of of soft beverages, then highly recommend you put on some gloves, put on a mask. Uh, douse yourself in kerosene, light yourself on fire, and run down to Walmart to pick up some Mountain Dew Frostbite. It's, it's absolutely worth the money. It's absolutely worth the trip, and I think you will be disappointed. Next, we will get into what I've been playing, which is this week. Like I said, you know, my work called me back and said, hey, fucker, I know everyone's trying to self-quarantine and not die, but we don't give a shit about your, your existence. Come on down and, and get back to work. So I've been working and my work has been restructuring like crazy because so many people are getting laid off and our business is changing drastically so I'm basically doing extensive bitch work outside and I'm I'm sweating my ass off and my hours got like longer and shittier than ever before so that's actually not to complain about my job I'm actually extremely grateful to be employed right now because there are a lot of people being laid off and as a side note, if anyone listening to the show has been affected financially through the from the coronavirus, my deepest condolences. This is this is frightening. This is awful, and uh, I really feel feel for anyone going through anything like that at the moment. But yeah, my my job has just been working me like crazy lately. So while I am very appreciative and grateful to be employed, I'm also <laughs> left with this kind of really rough work life balance. Which you know, if it's a short term thing, that's totally fine. I I gotta do what I gotta do. Uh, but it has not left me with a lot of time to be playing games or resting or having any kind of outside of work life. So needless to say, the few hours I had this past week to play games, I uh, popped back into ReCore. I really thought I was at the very end of the game, and it turns out I kind of am. So ReCore is one of those games where, you know, I said I said a lot of good things about this last week, and I stand by it for the most part, but it's one of those games where you kind of clear, you clearly see, you get to this point in the game where you clearly see, oh, this is where the team ran out of budget and ran out of time for the game. This is where you can see they had a few more levels in mind before you get to the end of the game. But then they're like, uh-uh, release date's coming up. 
we don't have any more money. It's time to shit or get off the pot. And basically what happens with Recore is you get to the end of the game. This isn't a spoiler. This is just frustrating. You get to the end of the game. You fight this massive boss. He's the, <clears throat> he's the penultimate boss, if you will. And then before you get to that final boss, um, you're basically just left with this, like, this tower you have to ascend. It's five floors of like increasingly difficult waves of enemies and puzzles and platforming challenges, which I'm totally cool with, whatever. But basically the game forces you to exit the dungeon, go out into the open world, collect a bunch of useless bullshit, and complete a bunch of dungeons and really rank up and level up to become strong enough to fight these these remaining enemies. So it's one of those things where like the game is just progressing and pacing nicely and then it just grinds to a halt and makes you go back and do all this side bullshit to make up for the fact that they don't have some extra levels it's just kind of like padding out the the play length of the game and i really really dislike that a lot and so i'm kind of frustrated with that i'm kind of out in the open world leveling up collecting some shit so i can go back and finish the game i'm like there i'm at the gate i'm at the end of the game last 40 minutes max uh, I just got to go grind and collect for a couple hours before I can get there. So when I get some time, I'm going to wrap up ReCore. I tried to, out of respect for my own time and out of frustration for the fact that that's kind of how the game ends, I was going to just quit playing the game altogether. But I, I tried doing that and I just, it kept nagging at me that I'm so far along and I want to see this thing through to the end. So I'm just going to buckle down and do it because I'm a little bitch, but that's where I'm at with ReCore, and that's what I've been playing this week. So hopefully next week we'll have some more interesting news. Hopefully next week I will still have a job. And hopefully next week you will all still have jobs. And hopefully, most importantly, we will all be healthy and free of coronavirus. I know that's another really, obviously, the, the most important thing kind of going on right now, I, I should say. You know, this podcast, and I've heard from a lot of the other podcasts I listen to, it's just listenership's been kind of weird lately. A lot of people are just falling off Patreons and just the listenership is coming in and out. People are listening on different days. Some people aren't listening to shows they normally listen to. It's just kind of statistics and analytics are just kind of all over the place because a lot of people are having their lives shaken around right now. People are having family members, loved ones fall sick. People are losing their jobs. People are being furloughed. People are being laid off. People are being reduced pay or having their jobs completely change. And it's just a lot of going, a lot going on. So I'll try not to talk about that anymore. Just know, like I said, deeply sorry if anything like that is going on in your life and uh, don't ever feel pressured to participate in the show by commenting or listening uh, just because I do such a good job of persuading you to do so. Seriously, if, if there's anything going on in your life, like take care of your health and your family and, and your career first before you uh, dedicate any time to something as, something as trivial as my, my stupid podcast about video games. So let's try to let's try to lighten up the mood. We'll, we'll talk about some news. Hopefully there won't be any COVID news. We can just talk about video games and surfing and drinking IPAs all day long. So let's let's jump in. All right, our first news story is all about the coronavirus. So it seems as though the production of next generation consoles like the Xbox Series X may be facing some delays and difficulties as a result of the COVID-19. Speaking with IGN, a handful of analysts speculate that the supply of the new console may be limited if they make their 2020 release dates, and therefore demand itself would shoot up. A good problem to have if your name is Nintendo, but for most of us, we want to have availability to purchase the console, and if you're Microsoft, you want to have the supply to meet that demand. While for the time being, the, the effects of the coronavirus have proven beneficial for those in the video game industry as a whole, the long-term effects may be just the opposite. And what I mean by that, of course, is that game sales, people playing games, just game time in general has gone up because people are at home, but this can turn into something much worse if people start really losing their work, of course. The reason why I mentioned the IGN podcast at the top of the show is because, you know, Ryan McCaffrey, the host of the IGN Xbox podcast Unlocked, actually gets into this a little bit, kind of about these rumors and speculation of potential delays for the console. And Phil Spencer actually spoke to this, and basically, basically what he says is, you know, obviously the first thing we're concerned about is the health of our staff. So if, if, if the team at Xbox is able to do what they need to do, and get this console out on time, there's no way in hell that we see this thing getting delayed. As of right now, they see everything as on track. They're not really having issues with suppliers and manufacturers and everything overseen and all that. So they see this as absolutely making its internally projected 2020 release date. But he, what he's saying is obviously every day news changes, things change. You never know if this thing takes a turn for the worse, if you can even get worse 
which it will probably. But, you know, assuming that things don't get even worse than we're speculating that they get, Microsoft and Xbox thinks that they can get this console out by the end of the year, no problem, which is, of course, a great thing. But, you know, like they said, in terms of um, taking care of their, their, their staff and their employees, and if something unforeseeable happens, which is absolutely likely, you know, then things could change but for the time being they don't they don't even have a plan b they don't even pr- anticipate this delaying in fact he even went as far as to say they wouldn't delay the console for like a game meaning that like if it came down to like the xbox series x itself is ready to go and they can ship it but like halo infinite has to get delayed because you know uh, 343 is working from home they can't really pull that last part of the game together in the original time frame since they're not at the office anymore, then they would delay the game and still release the console. They are not, you know, they have every intention of releasing this console on time. This is an interesting back and forth. It's like, how can you dispute, you know, the words of the man himself, Phil Spencer? He's he's the guy to know the answer if anyone's going to know the answer. While on the other hand, you got these industry analysts and speculists just, you know, saying that it's it's highly likely these consoles get delayed. So I've been in the camp, you know, for the past few weeks that these consoles will get delayed and that they'll probably release next spring, probably somewhere around the March time frame. This time next year is what I assume. But, you know, Phil Spencer's kind of candor and confidence that this that this box is coming out this year kind of swayed me back a little bit to where I don't think he's lying. I don't think it's PR talk. I don't think he's trying to stop, you know, this 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 pandemic um, from getting I, I don't think he's trying to stop this this uh coronavirus shit from getting you know ruining the news cycle and ruining the messaging on the console i think he's being dead serious and he's being transparent that if they can get the box out by the end of this year which they expect they which they suspect they will then they'll do so so i i believe him on that but this this virus keeps taking a new turn every day things keep getting progressively worse regardless of where you live in the world it looks like a lot of a lot of countries a lot of governments are lying about numbers and then kind of not reacting fast enough and and in the defense of a lot of governments and a lot of businesses in particular we've never really dealt like anything like this in the in the modern age so this is this is a lot to to work with this is a lot of change all at once this is a lot of kind of things people haven't ever really been prepared for and you know obviously this isn't the bubonic plague or anything like that but back in those days i don't think medieval europe really had really had a modern working economy or society the way we have today. So it's not like you can't really compare the two things and say like, well, judging by history, we've dealt with this before. This is how we'll handle it. It's like, this is just, this is something crazy. This is something we will all remember for the rest of our lives and, and speak about. This is like the next 2008 recession, the next 9-11. This is the next thing that will, you know, we'll always look back and remember this and talk about this and how the world was never quite the same after we got through this because it's just going to change that many things. So it's really, really hard, you know, for anyone, whether it be Phil Spencer or any analyst to really say definitively whether or not these consoles will be delayed. But I guess what I'm trying to convey to you is that there are so many unknown factors here at play that it really is anyone's guess. And so I guess the point of the story is more to just present you with two sides of the same argument and say, it's a possibility, but there's really no strong indication as to which way it's going to go. We're just, we're all, it's like anything regarding the coronavirus. We're all just kind of here waiting for news. We're all just kind of on the edge of our seats, sitting at home, waiting for someone to tell us when we can go back to our normal lives or, or if things are going to get worse. So, but yeah, hopefully, you know, obviously there's some much more important things out there, like taking care of the people affected from this virus and making sure our economy doesn't completely collapse. But, uh, you know, tertiary to all of that, it'd be nice to also get our Xbox Series X this year. And the, and the other thing is, if, if this really fucks over the economy long term as, as much as it potentially could then this can really screw over both Microsoft and Sony in regards to whether or not the market even wants a next generation console. You know, we talk about the Series X potentially being a $600 box. If, you know, 30% of your country is out of work, if, if, if people all around the world are hurting for cash and people are unemployed, I don't know who really can afford to jump out there and buy an Xbox Series X regardless of how badly they want to, you know? So that's another thing that could really affect these consoles is even if they can make it to market, does the economy, will the economy be strong enough to really support, you know, a vibrant player base that that has the money to dish out for these consoles and these new games and everything? Who knows? But here here's hoping that it all pans out so that at the end of this year we can uh, we can all we can all focus on Halo Infinite and shooting some Covenant and um in figuring out what the hell Cortana's up to because I know she's not a bad girl. She's just done some bad things. All right. 
please, for the love of God, let's stop talking about the coronavirus. Let's move on to our next story. Speaking of COVID-19, the virus seems to be introducing new challenges to Xbox Game Studios. Speaking with GameSpot, studio head Matt Booty said, quote, We know that gaming connects people during these social during times of social distancing, and we are committed to delivering the highest quality Xbox Game Studios games from our glo- for our global community of players, Booty reportedly told GameSpot in a statement. He s- continues with, quote, At the same time, the health and safety of our Xbox Game Studio development teams is our top priority. Each studio is facing unique challenges and constraints depending on the particular location, and many of our external development partners around the world are similarly affected. We are supporting our studio leaders to make the right decisions for their teams and the individual games during this time of challenge, end quote. The effects have already been seen in the way of the of delaying Mojang's upcoming Minecraft Dungeons, which has been pushed back from its vague April release date to a more concrete May 26. The team has had to work from home, causing the last stretch of development to be more challenging than usual. While the delay is unfortunate, at least we now have a firm release date, and while while the developers are able to get the remaining work done from the safety of their own homes. Additionally, the game is available now for pre-order, but you really should just play it via Game Pass unless you're some kind of Nintendo Switch playing Square. But wait, there's more. Since the coronavirus is like an attention-depraved hoe who feels like they need to constantly interject themselves where they don't belong, developer In Exile has revealed that their upcoming role-playing game, Wasteland 3, has also been delayed to August 28th. Again, the benefit of the delay is that the devs are now working from home, which should, of course, decrease their chances of catching the Rona. So, yeah, those three separate stories that came out this week, I ended up lumping them all together because I I, I suppose they kind of work together. Yeah, again, so (laughs) first we talked about the console delay, potentially. Now we're going to talk about the game delays, potentially, and 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 more concretely because two of them are have already been delayed. So with Minecraft Dungeons, first of all, let me let me get this one out of the way. I don't fully believe that the game was delayed because of coronavirus because even up until this past week they were still vaguely saying april as the release date you know this is even before the coronavirus became like a real threat in here in the states so to think that like you know this one extra month this this one like four weeks or whatever it is is going to make all the difference between working in the office and working from home to get this game out Seems a little like, I don't know, head scratchy. It seems like, if anything, the game needed a bit of a delay anyway. And now they're using the coronavirus as an opportunity to be like, ah, here's that extra, that little extra stretch of, of, of time we needed to get the game out. Although, to play devil's ad- advocate to that point, I don't really know anyone who's like fervoring for this, who's like foaming at the mouth for this game. So I don't really know that that this game you know, needed a kind of skirt or workaround to talk about the delay because it doesn't seem like people are talking about this game all that much, although I'm sure it will do fine since it has the Minecraft name attached to it. Um, But nonetheless, coronavirus is having some impact as, you know, kind of what I was reiterating with what Phil Spencer was saying to IGN uh, about how, you know, put put their teams first, their, their workers and their safety and their health first, and then focus on, you know, the more ancillary things like video games as afterwards. So it's kind of the appro- approach Matt Booty's taking with uh, Xbox Game Studios, which is, of course, you know, take care of the staff and uh, hopefully, you know, we can get through all this shit. But this is a this is a crazy unprecedented time. Of course, some smaller games and such are made from home. You know, games like Ori in the Blind Forest and Ori in the Will of the Wisps. Those games are actually made remotely. Uh, but not every game can really work like that. It's really hard to make a Halo Infinite or something of that magnitude. You know, from from remotely from home and then kind of work with people through the internet. I just don't really see how you do that easily, especially when you spent years and years developing the game in a studio and now you got to stop everything you're doing, split up, go home and kind of restructure your workflow. So this is just, it's a lot of logistical stuff. It's like, it's not even so much that this work can't be done from home. It's that they have to stop in the middle of what they're doing and then reorient themselves. You know, every single person in the studio has to reorient themselves and figure out how to do what they were doing from from their home as opposed to in the studio. So, I mean, it, it makes sense that some of these games are going to be delayed a couple months here, a couple months there, especially with uh, Wasteland 3. That one makes perfect sense. It's like a three or four month delay. I can, I can buy that for sure. I guess the real hope here is that this doesn't end up affecting, you know, the next Forza or the next Halo because those are the games we're really, we're really hoping come out day and date with the Xbox Series X and kind of show off um, the technical prowess of the of the new box and 
Uh, it's really important for Microsoft that you know they have those tentpole games to go with this new console. While of course these games will be playable on the Xbox One and Xbox One X, it is really ideal to have these new games also there with your new next gen console, the Series X. So here's hoping no more games have to get delayed. But the important thing is that the devs are able to safely work from home, and Xbox is doing the right thing by really focusing focusing on their team in this this kind of uncertain time rather than just getting these games out the door, which is a respectable uh, stance to take. And, and of course, they kind of have to, you know, the PR nightmare that would ensue as a result of, of not handling things these way, this way, especially when you get the likes of Kotaku ready to just jump at anyone and, and tell the world while they're, why they're all evil and, 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 and um, racist and Nazis and shit. So anyway, so that's what's happening right now. COVID's basically delaying everything and ruining our lives and in, in every meaningful and not so meaningful way imaginable. Uh, but Minecraft Dungeons coming out May 26th. This is pretty good. This is We're on a roll with the first party games this year. We already got Ori in the Will of the Wisps. Then we got Bleeding Edge. Now we're about to get Minecraft Dungeons. So we've got a nice little roll of games coming here. And so I'm all about this. And it's nice that these kind of games, you know, one late May, one in late August. We're getting like these, these kinds of summertime games. Although I think one of these games would do a little better in the month of June or July. But still, it's awesome to see some games kind of fill out those summer months even if it is the more traditional May or late summer kind of window. Uh, anyway, so that's what that's where we are with the Xbox Game Studio games. Now we will hopefully move away from the coronavirus. Uh, but before we do, let me quick tell you this little little story that I just noticed here that happened a few hours ago as of the time of this recording, and it is that Bethesda will not be holding a digital replacement for its E3 show. Uh, So this is on IGN. I'm literally just pulling up the article because it wasn't here a few hours ago when I was writing this week's show notes. So Bethesda has has basically confirmed on Twitter. Pete Hines from Bethesda said, given the many challenges we're facing due to the pandemic, we will not host a digital showcase in June. We have lots of exciting things to share about our games and look forward to telling you more in the coming months. I just take that as, you know, they they don't really want to put together a whole presentation because they don't have shit to show off really right now. I mean, yeah, sure. They've got, you know a new game from Arcane maybe or Tango Gameworks is Ghostwire Tokyo and then eventually Starfield and Elder Scrolls 6 which were way prematurely announced um, but people already really hate Bethesda right now especially with the, all the Fallout 76 stuff so it's best that they just lay low and and take this as a blessing and an opportunity to kind of just uh, regain some humanity with the uh, with the games community um, and just lay low for a while I think that's I think that's for the best so they're skipping out on any kind of E3 a related presentation, which is just fine by me, as nine times out of ten, they really don't need to do these presentations they do, but they insist on doing them anyway. All right, our next story is actually kind of about something that was was already known, but I haven't really touched on the show, and it's about the Xbox Series X controller, the gamepad that comes with the console. Uh, so the story reads, since the since Xbox started going wireless with their controllers back in 2005 with the launch of the Xbox 360, they have opted for the two AA batteries approach over the more conventional modern approach of rechargeable internal batteries. While Microsoft would eventually go on to be criticized for this, especially as we headed into the Xbox One era in late 2013, that would prove to not change uh, the company's stance on how they, they would juice their game pads. As of this week, I can now confirm, because I haven't confirmed in previous weeks, as I should have, uh, but apparently this was announced like a week or two ago when they really unveiled all the Xbox Series X details. Uh, but when the console hits stores shelves later this year, its controllers will indeed still require two AA batteries. Now, Microsoft is still planning on offering the rechargeable battery pack uh, that consumers can purchase separately, uh, as they have for both the 360 and the One. Uh, but if you were hoping for Microsoft to jump on the bandwagon, it looks like that will not be the case this time around. What exactly is Microsoft's reasoning for sticking with the batteries, you might ask? Well, they are claiming that it's about flexibility. Flexibility. That's what Phil Spencer says. Microsoft found after an internal discussion that fans and users are about 50-50 split on whether to do AA batteries or rechargeables. By offering batteries with the option to get a rechargeable battery pack, it caters to both audiences while not needing to necessarily make a compromise. Microsoft also mentions that the reason for sticking with the AA battery layout is that they wanted to keep the consistency design-wise for the with the Xbox One controller since all accessories for the Xbox One are forward compatible as well, including the controllers. So this one doesn't bug me too much. I guess the real real reason why I want to to mention this is because this is going to be one of those things that gets eye rolls. You know, you think about like the PS3 controller, the PS4 controller, the Nintendo Switch controller, the Nintendo um, Wii U controllers. Basically everything 
at least the past two consoles from both Nintendo and Sony have been internal batteries that you recharge. You plug it up via USB, micro USB, whatever, you charge the damn controller and you're good to go. Now, back in the 360 PS3 days, I actually used to complain. I used to be in that camp that complained about why Microsoft didn't just do that like Sony did or like Nintendo did. Although back then, you know, the Wii took AA batteries as well. But I actually kind of agree with Microsoft, and 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 I I I actually kind of drank this Kool Aid and got on this bandwagon because of something Panos Panay says about the Microsoft Surface products. So for those who don't know, I mentioned him from time to time, but Panos Panay is uh he's the guy at Microsoft who's really the the one responsible for the Surface products, the Surface computers Microsoft does. But he's really moved up a lot within Microsoft in recent years. He he actually helped to work on the Xbox Series X. He's a uh, he he worked on the design and kind of working on the cooling system for the Xbox series x along with the xbox team so he he does a lot of microsoft he he's like heading up windows now these days uh so he's like he's become a very big important person at the company but you know the the pens obviously i'm sure most of you know the surface computers that microsoft makes they have an optional pen accessory a surface pen you can buy for drawing and note taking and the pen actually by default, the, the regular pen is actually a single, Is it, I think it's a single AAA battery. I don't know. I've never opened mine up and really checked, but I've never run out of the battery. It's, it lasts so long. But yeah, it still takes a battery. And the reason Microsoft says that they went with the battery, or the reason why Panos says they go with the battery over the rechargeable aspect is that, you know, you think about when you're in the middle of working on something or, or playing a game or whatever, right? And then your controller or your pen or whatever runs out of battery. You don't want to have to stop and plug up and be tied close to the TV, close to the console, or into this recharging mode, or had to take a break from what you're doing because you have to charge. You want to just be able to do what you were doing and as you were doing it. And by able by being able to just switch it into a new battery pack, obviously you have that, that flexibility, as Phil Spencer was saying, to just kind of get right back in the action, get right back to doing what you were doing and as you were doing it. And so I do buy that in the sense that's like, okay, that makes sense. Now, with Surface Pens, it's a little different because those Surface Pens, the batteries last like two years on them. And the new Surface Pen actually is rechargeable because it, when it magnetically attaches to the computer, it just recharges now, like like the iPad ones kind of do, and so or not like the iPad ones kind of do. It kind of just recharges off the off the the keyboard case now when you attach it. So it's kind of a bad example because Microsoft kind of revised that. Um, but with in regards, I th- I think that that explanation, that kind of example, works in regards to the Xbox controllers, where where I kind of see that point where it's like. Yeah, sure, it's nice that, you know, your Nintendo Switch controller or your PS4 controller or whatever has an internal battery pack, but, you know, the second you run out of battery, if that's the only controller you have, you have to now plug up wired to your console in order to charge it, and you want to stand, you you know, if you're sitting far away from your TV, you might have to get closer now because the cable's only so long and all these things. It can become a cumbersome thing or an inconvenience for you rather than a convenience. Whereas, you know, if you get the AA batteries and then you run out of batteries, well, you can just switch to new batteries. Or if you have the battery pack like I have for my Xbox One controllers, then you can just swap out the pack or you can just plug up like you would on a PS4. So it's just, it's not that there's one superior option over the other, but it's that by going with the battery slash battery pack option, you just have more options on how you want to do it. And I do understand that convenience of wanting to just swap out on the fly. The other thing that's nice about the Xbox controllers is you can just buy like the Duracell rechargeable batteries. I have a bunch of those as well. They're way cheaper in the long run than buying a bunch of Xbox branded battery packs. And, you know, you can just buy a big pack of those rechargeables and use them on all your Xbox controllers. And that way, when you run out of batteries, instead of having to plug up, you basically just pop out the old ones and pop in the new ones. I guess the only reason why I'm making a big thing out of this is because there just seems to be this stigma. And I I really think smartphones are to blame for this. You know, we live in the era of anything that's battery powered now, you plug it up and you charge it. You don't replace batteries. We're not used to, we're no longer used to like, you know, using physical batteries for anything. The only things that I own that I can think of that I ever use batteries for is like the tuner for my guitar or like the TV remote. You know, you just don't use batteries anymore like you used to. It's just become so antiquated. So I think there's such something about like the new Xbox console coming out in 2020 and batteries, you know, like Duracell batteries that just doesn't like really mesh together. But I I think in Microsoft's defense, their argument is uh, is a sound one. And I do see the benefit to this uh, flexibility that that Spencer was talking about. I don't know. I just, I I don't even expect to have that much to say on it, but 
it, it does make sense in terms of just the flexibility and but but still I do see I do see this being one of those annoying things where console war fanboys end up picking on Xbox because who uses batteries in 2020 yada 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 but yeah I'm all for it I'm just gonna use my battery packs I have and and make it work with that and no big deal but yeah that's that's where we are on the batteries that's why Microsoft is going sticking with them and now we will move on to a new story from trueachievements.com so here's an upside here, here here's an upside to the coronavirus since everyone is home all the time now like a bunch of nerds Microsoft has seen an increase of cloud service usage of 775% in areas with enforced social distancing measures So what's the bad news? Well, in order to accommodate this need for the massive increased usage, uh, specifically for more important services like Microsoft Teams, uh, the company has decided to limit some of Xbox Live's functionality. So custom gamer picks have temporarily been disabled, and Microsoft is now delivering updates during off-peak hours of the day. Overall, Xbox Live has been experiencing some slowdowns in recent days, and minor issues have been reported, like achievements not popping properly as a result. Uh, While all this is, of course, temporary, it is no doubt a bit frustrating so yeah i've seen a lot of people complain about this on twitter and just in the xbox community in general a lot about just little quirks and things not working i think there's been some confusion some people think it's because the current insider build of the xbox dashboard is is being a little glitchy or something like that but they don't realize this is an intentional thing microsoft's rolling back on so yeah they're just they're just turning off some little features here and there that don't really make up a whole lot of the experience of gaming on Xbox, but just kind of help them save some, I guess, streaming bandwidth or, or, uh, or cloud bandwidth in general. Um, since, you know, there's just so much added usage. So for those that don't know, obviously all cloud services run by Microsoft are, they use their Azure technology and that isn't obviously just used for Xbox. It's also used for, you know, all services and products Microsoft has it. They use it for office 365 and all, all these other things. And right now, you know, aside from office, a huge thing that Microsoft is seeing like a massive increase in usage from is Microsoft teams, which is, it's kind of hard to explain what Microsoft Teams is because it's kind of its own thing, but it's like if you took Slack and you took Skype and then added a bunch of awesome new features in addition to that and rolled it all into one massive service, it's like a virtual work office in one service. And obviously, a lot of a lot of schools, a lot of businesses have been, you know, all from home lately. So there are a lot of classes and meetings and work uh, sessions being conducted from home. And they're using programs like Microsoft Teams to really uh, get that work done. And so while this is great news and that Microsoft's products and services are being bought, used, whatever thought of, it's really taking a massive toll on their uh, infrastructure. It's really testing it because it's just such an increased usage that was so unexpected and unlike anything they'd ever seen before. So obviously this is uh, having some slight effects on on uh, gamers right now. So don't be alarmed if you see anything weird like a, a little quirk with your achievements or your gamer picture isn't popping up or when you look at your friends list, there are just some details missing. These are just like weird little things here and there they are disabling to kind of save bandwidth that for the time being but it's uh, nothing's broken you don't need to restart you don't need to update you don't need to contact microsoft they know what's up you're just being a, you're, you're being an overactive bitch just get back to your game and stop stop worrying about you worry about you you let microsoft worry about your gamer picks okay fucking perv all right our next story comes from ign remedy entertainment the studio behind control max Payne, alan wake has signed a two multi-platform publishing deal for next gen games and says both are set in the same franchise in a statement from the company it was revealed that the unspecified publisher will fully fund the game development costs and that remedy will see a quote 50 percent share of the net revenue from sales whilst retaining the intellectual property and aforementioned games the statement also went into some detail about the games that are part of the uh, of this agreement. The first is a triple A multi platform game, which appears to be an unannounced third project alluded to uh, in Remedy's financial report, which which we talked about a handful of episodes back. According to the statement, the game is in pre-production right now. As for the second project, this is a, quote, small-scale project set in the same franchise, end quote. With Remedy now in control of Alan Wake and and actively teasing a crossover in Control's upcoming DLC with the Alan Wake universe, this could be the crossover some fans have been waiting for. Later in the statement, the strategy of the partnership is referred to as, quote, creating and developing Remedy's own IP into long-term franchises, end quote which would suggest that the studio is not required to ready the studio is not 
quite ready to leave its compelling worlds behind. Both games mentioned will be launched on PC and next-gen consoles in the next few years. Um, so I think a little bit after this story broke, it was actually revealed that the unknown publisher was Epic Games. Um, so Epic is kind of getting in bed with a handful of devs right now. Um, they're also getting in bed with the team behind Inside and uh, Limbo, as well as another studio that escapes me at the moment. Um, so Play 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 Dead uh, is this is the team between, behind uh, Limbo, and then of course Remedy. Um, so they're trying to get into the games publishing deal right now, which is a little interesting. Um, obviously, Epic's been trying to stretch their wings a lot and get into some interesting kind of businesses with the Epic Game Store, kind of competing with Valve, and now with some publishing to kind of get into even bigger projects. But when you have that fuck you Fortnite money, I guess you can kind of do whatever the hell you want. Um, but I'm going to focus on Remedy just because obviously Remedy has some some relation here to Xbox. And it looks like, you know, if there's any hope that maybe Remedy would be Xbox's next acquirer acquired studio it looks like that's gotten shot down as they keep they keep just jumping in bed with these different publishers and these different these different companies for all these different things so you know they got 505 who published control then they kind of went on an exclusive deal with sony for the dlc and some extra game content and then they made this uh then they agreed for that crossfire uh game that korean game that multiplayer game that they're making a campaign for which is for xbox now um, but then they're also working out with Epic Games for two new games that seem to be set in the Control Alan Wake universe. So it seems like they're going to tie those two worlds together, uh, which we, they've been teasing for a while and fans have been asking for. Um, but also it looks like they're, they're getting some new games, which will be coming to Xbox Series X as well as PC and other consoles. But yeah, nonetheless, this is just some interesting stuff. I don't think Remedy is looking to be acquired now. This is I'm under the impression now that Remedy is trying to remain independent. Who knows if this goes really well with Epic, maybe Epic will try to pick them up and, and buy them. But at the same time, it's like, I see th what happens with Remedy here is like the exact opposite of what I would expect to happen. If like, if I didn't know any better, I would think a studio like Remedy would want for Microsoft to buy them, you know, so they could have that financial stability that they that they never have because games like Alan Wake, Control, Quantum Break, all these games are while great games, you know, they just never get the public attention they deserve. But on the other, but in reality, it kind of works just the opposite, where it's like. It doesn't seem like they want to be bought. They're constantly jumping from partner to partner to get games published, to get games picked up, and it just doesn't seem like they have any intention of uh, really settling down with a, a parent company, which is, you know, all the power to them if that's what they want to do. For all we know, Microsoft has tried to buy Remedy, maybe. Who knows? Maybe Remedy said no, or Remedy asked Microsoft if they'd be interested in partnering, and Microsoft said no. I don't imagine Microsoft would say no because they need all the partners they can get, or they needed all the partners they could get when they had a closer relationship with Remedy. But nonetheless, I just find this really interesting, especially of all companies like someone like Epic Games to work with Remedy. Nonetheless, I'm excited for Alan Wake and, and uh, Control fans, especially because people are really, fans of the series are really clamoring for more Alan Wake, and it looks like they're going to be getting it. Of course, it's not totally confirmed in, in all this news here, but it's, it's pretty certain that that's what they're alluding to. So I, I think it's safe to kind of get your hopes up, um, but you know, if they get dashed, don't blame me. And now it's time for a wrap-up story of the week. So, on Tuesday, Activision announced that the famed 2009 first-person shooter, Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2, is coming to the Xbox One next month. In fact, the game is out now on PlayStation 4, as it is a one-month timed exclusive. But rest assured, when it comes to Xbox One next month, it will look and run better thanks to some 4K HDR enhancements for the Xbox One X. The game costs 20 bucks, and it includes only the campaign, leaving out the game's original Spec Ops mode and the multiplayer component. The reason for the omission of these modes, Activision says, is to keep the multiplayer experience of Call of Duty currently locked on 2019's Modern Warfare reboot, as well as the recently released Warzone Battle Royale mode. For those that pre-order the game, they'll receive the UDT Classic Ghost Bundle, which can be used in Warzone. I know y'all are really hoping for some UDT Classic Ghost, so I hope this satiates you you enough to drop everything and, and pre-order this remake of the game you haven't thought about since uh, last decade. So yeah, this was rumored the day before it was popping up on like some Korean ratings board and then immediately launched the next day. Um, so this is cool. Modern Warfare 2, the the goodest Modern Warfare game. The, I don't know, arguably the first two are the ones people care about the most, but 
It's, it's getting its little remake. So you got the first Modern Warfare that got its remake. Then now you got the second Modern Warfare that's getting its remake. But this one's not getting the multiplayer stuff. It's just the campaign, which I understand that they want to... They don't want to keep splintering the Call of Duty player base. You, you've got mobile, you got the Battle Royales, you got the new game that comes out every year. If you just keep giving people more and more excuse to play other Call of Duty multiplayer games, you're just going to take that same player base and keep spreading them so thin across all platforms that before you know it, the experience on each Call of Duty is going to be significantly reduced because every player is going to be on a different game, which is a real concern to have when you're Call of Duty because you have so many games coming out all the fucking time. They are currently supporting two Battle Royale games, an annual big budget Call of Duty game, and uh, and a mobile experience. So yeah, I, I understand the reason to omit the multiplayer features and aspects of this game, but I could definitely see this really upsetting people, and I'm sure people are already fuming online. I just haven't really looked into the reactions to this news, so I'm not quite sure personally. Uh, but nonetheless, this is uh, I think this is a good pickup. I, I actually might even pick this up and just play through Modern Warfare 2 so I can remember what it was like when I was when I was young, innocent, and uh, playing that really controversial level where you go into an airport and shoot people. But hey, you can skip it. But yeah, so definitely look forward to that in the, in the coming weeks. Of course, PlayStation gets their timed exclusivity because this generation, they are the favorite child. But rest assured, the Xbox Series X could flip all of this. Maybe maybe Xbox will get the Call of Duty favoritism next generation again like they, like they once had. So uh, yeah, definitely look forward to that. Um, looks like if you got an Xbox One X, you get some added uh, visual perks to that. Uh, but yeah, not much to say other than that. Call of Duty, it's uh, there's always more of it, so I can't imagine anyone is is uh, clamoring for more Call of Duty. But I guess the sales for that franchise say otherwise. So there's that, and that's gonna do it for all our big news stories of the week. Of course, we do have our little. I always refer to them as tidbit stories, which I actually really hate the term tidbit. So I really want to get away from using that. Um, most podcasts would call something like this like a rapid fire section, but I also really hate the term rapid fire, which which every which every podcast seems to use. So I, I I always think about whenever I say the word tidbit, I'm always like I need to think of a new name to refer to this section as because I hate tidbits and I hate rapid fire. Um, but that's about as far as I get with the thought process on that. I just I, I think oh I need to come up with a new name for this, and then I stop thinking about it, and then the next week uh, rinse repeat. Uh, but here we go, some quick little stories for this week. So as we head into the next generation of consoles, we will begin to see many games as a service type games from recent years move onto the new hardware. Now we have confirmation of one of those games, uh, which is Warframe, and it has been confirmed to be coming to the Xbox Series X at some point in the future. Our next one here is that if you're a fan of the Nier series from Square Enix, you'll be happy to know that there's a new Nier Replicant remaster in the works. Today, the publisher sent, us, sent a press release with a teaser trailer and some accompanying text. The rebuilt version of the project is called Nier Replicant version 1.22474487139. No joke, that's literally what the game's called. It literally sounds like they have the Kingdom Hearts guys name this one. Uh, in addition to the news, Nier Automata will be joining Xbox Game Pass soon as the service makes its way to Japan. So I didn't really know that Nier was originally made by a different studio and had a, a, an initial entry-level game. I just thought Nier Autonoma was the first game, so I was uh, pleasantly surprised to learn that that's not that's actually not the tr the truth. Platinum took the helm uh, uh, for the franchise uh, for the second game, um, and then the studio that actually made the first one actually eventually disbanded and went under. So um, this is the remake of that one, which is very different from. The Nier Autonoma that ended up blowing up and being commercially successful. Um, so this is a good way for these newer fans to kind of jump back and retroactively experience the game that started it all. So that's that's really cool. You just got to deal with the stupid name. But of course, it's uh, Square Enix here as the publisher. So it doesn't surprise anyone that we got a stupid name like that. But yeah, I look forward to that if you're a Nier fan. Uh, our next little quick story is a new rec pack for Halo 5 Guardians called Relief and Recovery is out now, and all proceeds from the purchase will go towards Global Giving's Coronavirus Relief Fund. The pack costs 10 bucks and is available for purchase until April 30th. Uh, make a difference, Spartans. I think I'm going to go ahead and pick this up because I love Halo and want to support a good cause and get some recs, rec, rec cards in Halo 5. So definitely go out to that if you want to... Uh, give some money to a good cause as well as earn some cool shit in Halo 5 which is as we all know the most criminally underrated Halo game ever and then our penultimate little 
little rapid fire here is Ghost Recon Breakpoint is now getting a six hour free trial available to everyone, as well as a friend pass. The friend pass allows players to join a friend's game who owns Breakpoint and play the entire game with them for free. The friend pass is available until June 16th. So Ubisoft is really trying to get people on board as they roll out all the overhaul updates to re reinvigorate that game after it's kind of disappointing initial reception and uh, release. And then our last one here is let's, of course, we'll, we'll end the end the week's news on a sad note. So leaving Game Pass in the near future are the following games. The Book of Unwritten Tales 2, Guacamelee Super Turbo, Super Turbo Championship Edition, which, by the way, if you haven't played that, definitely do so. It's a really good game. MX vs. ATV Reflex, Prey, and Samurai Showdown 2. Jump in while you can before it's too late, gamers. All right, and that's going to do it for all of our news for the week. Of course, the show is not over. We do have to talk about the upcoming games coming to Xbox this week, of which there are 10. So so gamers, get ready. Get your controllers primed. Get your AA batteries ready for switching or your rechargeables, you know, whatever works best for you. Um, but we got some new games that I think you might be interested in. Our first game here is called The Complex. So this is a really like realistic looking game. And I think that's the first thing you got to know about the game is the visuals are just that stunning, but you play as a woman uh, because I assume it's a reboot of a game where you probably initially played as a man, uh, but you play as a woman and she's a doctor or a research uh, scientist or something. And you're in her lab. I see there's a, there's a telescope. There is a, there's some machinery. There's some expensive scientific machinery in the background that I don't fully understand. But this woman is looking at the table and she has an option. There are two options to select. They are either delicate or crude. So I assume, you know, I think this is actually a pretty <laughs> a pretty tasteless game to be coming out right now. I think with coronavirus and the kind of effects it's having on our society, I think it's a little insensitive to make a game about the coronavirus. But it looks like you're basically a researcher trying to find a cure or a, a flu shot or some kind of uh, way around the coronavirus. And you have the options you make the options you you choose the options that will make the outcome you should desire so here we see the woman choosing whether or not to make a delicate solution to the problem or a crude solution to the problem and i can't you know i'm not going to play this game but i can only imagine what a crude solution to the coronavirus would be maybe that would be something like injecting people with diet coke and saying that hey here's a cure um, again, super insensitive to make a game like this at a time like now. Uh, but I, you know, I can, I'm only telling you what the games are. I can't speak on behalf of the, of the developers here, but that is the complex. Uh, it is out now. If you want to play a game where you lie and cheat your way through, um, this, um, this horrifying uh, global threat that, that we're all facing now, then I guess you can go ahead and do that if you're a sadistic fuck. But our next game here is called Shaolin vs. Wu-Tang, which is out now as well. This is a fighting game, and what makes this game really unique is, you know, we see a lot of those Japanese anime boy games, and this time it's actually a Chinese fighting boy game. So this is some one versus one combat. Here we see a girl, we see a guy... They are in hand, engaged in hand-to-hand -hand combat, and they are in a burning building. And now, you know, I got nothing against these classic fighting games. I understand why people love them. People love Mortal Kombat. They love they love Tekken. They love these kinds of games. But what I don't understand is, you know, if you're in a burning building, presumably a restaurant or a bar, which is what this looks like, why, why the fuck, why in God's good name are you going to engage in fist-to-fist -fist hand combat when you're in a burning building? It's like... Get the fuck out of the, the burning building. It's like, you want to fight to the death and see who comes out alive? Neither of you, you idiot. You're you're both going to burn to death. This building is on fire, you stupid idiot. And you are, you're both sending yourselves to your doom, um, regardless of who wins. Maybe, maybe that's the point of the game. Maybe I'm missing it entirely. Maybe maybe the point is that you both die, but who dies first is the more, uh, the, the more pathetic loser. I don't understand. But if you want to play a game a fighting game where your objective is to beat someone and come back and then immediately die afterwards, then this is the game for you. It's like, it's like if Mortal Kombat was about defeating your opponent and then doing a fatality on yourself. But yeah, you're basically going to fight this guy and then survive in a burning building. So that's that game. If you're a fucking idiot, you can go ahead and play that. But our next game here is called Totally Reliable Delivery Service, which is, by the way, a fantastic name for a game. My only gripe with it is judging by this screenshot, of which they kind of cheat because it's four screenshots in one shot. It kind of looks like a Roblox knockoff. And as a big proponent of Roblox, I, I really got to be honest. I, I think this is a kind of kind of 
uh, scummy, you know, for someone to take from such a small indie darling project like Roblox and, um, you know, rip off that and then for their own financial capitalistic gain. Uh, but nonetheless, this is Roblox, basically. Totally reliable delivery service. You can Roblox your way into skydiving. There's this guy who is in midair. He's like at least 20 stories in the air holding a oversized fire hydrant, uh, which I guess you can then use to kind of like launch yourself even further, which is pretty cool. There's a person swinging a baseball bat at nothing. There's a person dragging a teddy bear through the streets. This is... This is Roblox, don't get me wrong, but this is Roblox this is Roblox uncapped and untamed and I don't know if I like it. I definitely recommend it for young kids. Um but I don't know how I feel about, you know, this company ripping off Roblox when it's already such an underappreciated, undervalued game. Um but our next game here is called Random Heroes, which is out now. This is a game where you play as Rambo, but the twist is that it is an 8-bit indie game where you collect coins because games aren't about, you know, who wins and who loses. It's about getting high scores because, you know, before before we used to go to barcades and drink IPAs and stand around in Street Fighter 2 cabinets, we actually used to go to arcades when our parents would let us and pop quarters into machines because that's what we did back then and we didn't have the we didn't have social media it was just a different era you know it was like you just met up with kids and you play games and you challenge people to who's the best and random heroes is kind of the embodiment of that you know it's a grueling hard man you only get so many lives if you die you die that just is what it is um, but you tough up, you, be, you, t- you toughen up, you be a man about it, and you uh, you push through the end because it's a real it's a real game for real gamers. So shoot your way through that shit, man. Then we got Lost Artifacts here, which is literally looks like someone just um someone just like took a sledgehammer to my Xbox and then pulled out an iPhone 5s and uh, plugged up a a lightning cable, a lightning Apple Lightning connector to HDMI directly into the TV and said, "Hey, here's your new Xbox." Congrats, it's a fucking iPhone. I mean, like, literally the only thing this screenshot is missing is a giant ad for another app on top of the screen to make me know that it's an iPhone game. But, yeah, you can uh, you can go tap it on your TV screen all you want. The god thing is, goddamn thing isn't a touch screen, but this is a nice little iPhone game where there's a map, there's levels, you probably get rated at three stars, and and uh, it probably hits you up for ads in between every level and... And every millisecond to let you know that this game sucks ass. Our next game here, which looks pretty fantastic, not going to lie, it's called Snakey Bus. Now, this looks like a giant like tram vehicle just kind of winding down like a massive 3D marble maze. I'm not even going to talk shit about this game. This actually looks fantastic. So I definitely recommend you guys basically drop everything and go spend whatever it costs to buy Snakey Bus because it comes out April 3rd. And so you got to wait one more day. It comes, it's Friday release. Because good games happen on Fridays, uh, but this game looks awesome. It looks like you just um, you basically just drive these vehicles around these twisty little marble mazes and try to uh, soon make it through the course. But uh, that's fucking awesome. All right, next game here is called Horrors of the Deep. So this game is basically Horrors of the Deep, which is an Xbox One X enhanced game. It is a horror game. I'm really tired of these games. It's basically Five Nights at Freddy's, but like the this is like you know when when your favorite band grows up and they try to do something different and you realize that's not the same band you used to like. This is like Five Nights at Freddy's doing the same thing. This is Five Nights at Freddy's growing up and realizing it's time to get shit together and act like it's 35 and now it's uh now it's pretending to be amnesia. So if you want to play Five Nights at Freddy's but amnesia, you can play this game where you walk through this abandoned medieval European castle looking place and get spooked by guys jumping out everywhere because that's what that's what this country really needs right now is more people being scared to death because we don't have enough fear being stricken into the hearts of our people as it is our next game is called hyper parasites now this is the little i think this is the anime game you've been waiting for it's top down it's gunny it's shooty uh, which i do like a lot but what i don't like about it is that basically you're on some giant ass playground it looks like the blacktop at like your elementary school and there's this giant like fucking mad max looking vehicle just blowing shit up so i guess basically this is saying is like when you know it's like one of those things when the when the when the kids are away the janitors will play so i guess this is like uh this is you know all the kids go home they're sent home the coronavirus social distancing so the premise is really awesome in that it is promoting social distancing it is promoting that we keep 
We keep ourselves away from the places where we're most susceptible to parasites, hence the name hyperparasite. Um, but it also shows that there is, for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction, um, which basically means if kids go home and have to homeschool for a few months because of the coronavirus, then the janitors who work at the schools will come out with large vehicular equipment and start blowing the shit out of the playground. So it looks like a fun game. It is an interesting premise, uh, but mostly I would just hate to be the kid who comes back to school after months of being off to only to find out that your janitor did quite the opposite of clean the campus while you were gone but rather he he blew the fuck up out of the uh the uh tetherball um pole and the basketball court and all that good shit so sucks to be those kids uh our next game here is called the curious expedition which looks like a game all about inventory management we see an arctic uh, uh, environment here with the sunken ship. There's a polar bear and a husky, which is the only saving grace of this game because those are two very cute animals. Uh, but there are a couple of men stranded on these blocks of ice that appear to be melting, and they are inventorying. They're they are managing their inventory. So these fuckers are basically here. This guy, for example, he's on the back of a polar bear. He's on a small sheet of ice that is clearly melting. He is stranded at the sea, and he is probably going to die. Yet, the, this fucker says, oh man, what can I do? Can I jump to the next block of ice and try to make my way to that ship? Can I try to make my way to land? Can I ride the back of this polar bear as it swims through the water back to land? Is there something I can do to save my pathetic fucking life? And his answer is no. I'm just going to manage my inventory, which is why literally half the fucking screen here is just... Let me let me tell you what's in his inventory if I can make it out through these poor, poor graphics. We've got dynamite. We've got a map. We've got a shovel. We've got a gun, looks like there's some snow boots, a necklace, a mirror, another shovel. What the fuck is this guy going to do? Dig himself into the ocean? Like, he's here, stranded in the middle of Antarctica, and he's just looking through his backpack, figuring out what he's, what, how, how he, what item he's going to um, discard, which one he's going to sell, which one he's going to scrap for parts, because it's a video game, and that's what you do with your inventory. So this game's fucking stupid. This is a game for people who actively want to die. So, probably a game for me. Uh, our next and final game here is called Resident Evil 3. Now, this game is pretty badass. It looks like these two guys with guns, and they're like the backdrop is like this city. It looks like a gloomy, dreary day. In the background of this dreary city is this evil guy looming over them. And this guy's honestly frightening. He looks kind of like Voldemort, but instead of the, the nose thing, he's got his bottom lip just pulled down all the way to his chin, so you can really see his teeth. This guy, this, this guy is like really into dental hygiene or something because he's like, check out my awesome teeth, but he's a fucking terrifying guy. So basically, I assume this game is about, you know, these two guys who kind of they have laser tag guns, so I assume they run around this city, they play laser tag, uh, it's sunset, but there's this one guy who's just looming over them. I assume he's like the scorekeeper. So you got the two guys with laser tag guns. The girl's already at a disadvantage because she has a smaller laser tag gun than the guy. But the guy's at a disadvantage because he has awful hair. Uh, and then, you know, the evil enemy is ab above the Voldemort-esque character. Is just, you know, oh, match point. You know, uh, girl one, man two, that kind of thing. So it's a laser tag game if you like laser tag games, which I do. Uh, you might want to check out Resident Evil 3, which comes out this Friday. Um, but whatever it, whatever it is, I, um, I I assure you, it is definitely worth $60. Because, you know, whether or not you're a fan of Laser Tag, the point is, this is likely not a remake of a game that's already happened before. And I'm all for, you know, I'm, I'm all for people remaking the same game and selling it to you over and over and over again. Uh, but this game clearly isn't that. It's a fully original game. I know they wouldn't try to sell me the same product twice, so definitely recommend you, you drop everything and play this laser tag game. And that's going to do it for our new game releases of the week. Thank you so much for bearing with us to the bare end. Uh, but now we are past the one hour mark, which means I got to start editing this so I can go to sleep at some point. As a reminder for Games of Gold, it is a new month, so we have new games. So listen up, you fuckers, or else you might miss it before you kiss it. Our first game here, our big game of the month, is Project Cars 2, which is available for the entire month of April. So download that if you like Project Cars. I'm a bigger fan of cars that are already complete already completed because I don't like to I don't like cars that are project cars. I don't know how to work on vehicles. Our next game here is called Knights of Pen and Paper Bundle. It is a $23 value and is avail available from April 16th to May 15th. 
for Xbox One. Then on the 360 backwards compatibility side, we've got Fable Anniversary from April 1st through 15th. That's a little bit of a cheap one because obviously if you have Game Pass, you already have Fable Anniversary. Uh, But if for whatever reason you don't have Game Pass because you hate yourself, I guess now you got Fable Anniversary for free. And then our final game is Toy Box Turbos, which is available from April 16th through the 30th. Uh, and that is a $10 value, so you got a little indie game there. So that is going to do it for all of this week's news. Thank you so much for sticking with us. While this isn't the best episode I've ever recorded, I definitely feel a little better about it than last week's episode. Last week I just felt like I put out a very subpar episode trying to get trying to get that quality back up there. I, I know you guys have a lot of options for podcasts to listen to, so it, I greatly appreciate that you listen to me talk about games of laser tag with uh, cities named after rodent animals like raccoons. Uh, But I'm going to, like I said, just sign off now. We're going to end it. Um, If you would like to follow me on social media, you can feel free to. My, uh, my name is, uh, is um, my name on social media is erect social, socially erect, erectile dysfunction, socially distanced six, six feet. Thank you so much for listening everybody. And now I'm going to go edit this podcast and get it out so that you can all listen to it tomorrow. Adios. Eric, can you say goodbye to our, our friends here? Uh, okay, so that's right.